Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying time is here. That's right, we're talking Friday the 13th on Kill by Kill. Greetings and salutations, Internet. This is your new favorite pal, Patrick Hampton. I'm coming to you from what used to be Camp Crystal Lake, but now it's the Kill by Kill podcast, where we are dedicated to celebrating the least discussed component of any horror film, the characters. Now, we're going to unpack all of the goriest of details of Friday the 13th, the 1980 original, and the hopes that a camp counselor's untimely end is just the beginning of the jokes that we can make about them. That's right. Everything is going to be out on the table. We're going to talk about every single hack and slash everything. It's it's all going to happen here. And let me tell you, there's no better person that I could discuss this with than my pal. She's out on the East Coast. She is from New Jersey. There's no one better prepared for this assignment. The one, the only Gina Radcliffe. How are you doing? I, I'm good. I'm ready for this. I, I am I am ready to uh, to talk about some of the greatest, most hilarious kills in, in movie history. <laughs> they do they they do get very funny. Uh unfortunately they don't get very funny very fast. I can't I can't say that, that Friday the thirteenth starts out with the bang necessarily, because it actually starts out with dry humping. But we don't want to go too far because we are going to unpack all the odd and brilliant and distracting details that are cooked into these characters. I think one of the reasons why we wanted to do this particular podcast is while there are a great many uh, horror podcasts out there and there's a lot of discussion about Friday the 13th as a franchise in the whole and a lot of talk about what the best kills are for per se. There's never a lot of discussion about the actual characters in these movies. And they're a big part of it. You spend a lot of time with some of these people. And we kind of wanted to have an opportunity to talk more about them. Before we get to them, Gina, let me ask you a quick question. What was the moment in your life that Friday the 13th entered your sphere? Well, I kind of, I grew up in uh, one of those households where my parents uh, were a little, possibly a little too laid back about letting me watch whatever I wanted to. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we had cable. We, we were among the first in the block to get it. I'm pretty sure my father loved television more than he loved air and food. So <laughs> we, we, we always had, yeah, we got the VCR early. We got the cable early, but I think I just happened to catch it when I was staying up way too late at night. It wasn't the first horror movie I'd ever seen. I'd seen Halloween before that. Probably I I had seen it first seen it would be around 1982 or so around whatever sure. whenever it would have come out on cable. Yeah, I think it was around then. I, my my now I grew up in a much more sort of repressive household. Uh, it, definitely in terms of the media, which I was allowed to consume. Uh, I had to ask permission uh, very memorably from my parents to watch King Kong when it came on a friend's cable channel. The the, the 76 version? Yes, the 76 one. <laughs> and having watched it again recently, I'm like, mm, what were they worried about? I mean, outside, I guess the, I guess when he holds, he holds a woman underneath the shower, there's some sexual yeah, that gets Overtones a little. He it. gets a little. It gets a little weirdly sexual, like when he literally blow dries her, and she's just like, <laughs> you know, throw your head back in ecstasy, and and all I can think about is just, my God, the smell. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, a giant like. gorilla. Who knows what that diet of that gorilla <laughs> is? And she rears her head back in at an <laughs> orgasmic pleasure. It's like I. Mm. <laughs> You've got some weird fetishes, lady. So I really didn't get exposed to horror films very often outside of Fangoria magazine. That was kind of my end. I was incredibly fearful as a child. Like the thing that constantly came up for me was that I was scared of the Pink Panther theme. And (laughs) when you think about it, it's a theme that demonstrates someone sneaking into where they shouldn't be. Now that I think about it, it's it's vaguely menacing, I guess. I I guess I can see that. In a very jazzy way. It's menacing. (laughs) I mean, 
now I am not. But at the time, for whatever reason, it just struck a chord in me, like someone's coming into your house. So in a way, I needed to dispel what I was afraid of. And I had a grandmother who said, I'm not going to buy you toys anymore, but I'll buy you anything you want to read. And I chose Fangoria so that I could learn what these tricks were so that I could demystify horror films for myself. And as a result, maybe I wouldn't be as scared of the world and impending doom as I was probably right up until I was 18 years old. I was going to say, um, did, did, did that work or are you, are you still afraid of impending doom? I can definitely uh, weird myself out. I, my wife and I were on a, a trip, um, a, a writer's retreat in, in Kauai. Actually, no, it was Maui. And we were in a yurt and it was open on all sides and was out on a cliff and it was absolutely gorgeous. But and in the middle of the night, I could not fall asleep because I heard everything <laughs> and i my imagination took hold and i just started writing horror movies instead of falling asleep and i did not fall asleep that night because i was afraid of what i don't know in particular uh, some sort of tourista's scenario was going through <laughs> my mind. So my imagination can absolutely take hold. But because I read about it and, and wanting to uh, demystify those magic tricks, I became sort of obsessed. And I didn't have the talent to become a makeup artist. Uh, I don't have those skills. But I just have become an enthusiast. And so when I did finally catch up, I think the first Friday the 13th uh, movie I saw was part two. Okay. Uh, it was on a videotape that someone had dubbed in a cabin in Big Bear, California. Wait, so you watched I, it in a cabin? In the woods. In the woods? That's, yes. that's, that's, the, that's for your first time. That was my first time. And how old were you? I would say I was 11, 12. <laughs> was yeah. the person that put this on like a, a professional sadist the, or anything like that? The person or? who put this on was a girl who was a year younger than me in the family that we were staying with. Okay, this kid's it, awesome. Yeah. Are you well, sure that she wasn't, had, are you sure she that had wasn't no me? Or, or? <laughs> no. <laughs> she was absolutely fearless. And, and I, this was sort of almost everything I wanted. I was going to finally get a chance to see these things in motion. So... From that moment on, I was very focused on horror movies and actually getting a chance to really see them. So uh, the first chance I got to work in a video store, I absolutely did. I saved up and bought my own VCR. I would make excuses to sleep downstairs so I could watch them in the middle of the night. It was really my thing, but it had to stay compartmentalized. It was not something that I could discuss with any family member or really the vast majority of my friends could give a rat's ass. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't really find anybody until I was probably well out of high school who, yeah. who shared the same affinity for horror movies that I did. I mean, I don't know if this is something that people thought was just something, I mean, back when, you know, the eighties, when being a nerd was not some sort of, did not, did not give you some sort of cool internet cadre where it actually was something that, you know, legit got you stuffed in the lockers and uh, not called up for a lot of dates or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, you weren't going to find a lot of people who admitted to liking stuff like that. I mean, you weren't going to find a lot of people who admitted to liking Star Trek back then. <laughs> and, it's like, and now it's like, you know, it, it's a cottage industry in and of itself. I was friends with a kid who was in a Star Trek show and it oh, wasn't really? cool to admit that you like Star Trek. Wait, wait, wait. Were you, were, were you friends with, were you friends with Will Wheaton? Yeah, I was. Really? Why is this coming up in the very first episode? Yes. I happened to be friends with Will Wheaton in high school. But not anymore. You guys had a falling out. I, he took me out for my 30th birthday. And I think that's the last time we spent. Well, uh, let, let's put this out there. It's not a falling out or anything. He, he married a woman who had children. Meanwhile, I hadn't lived in my own apartment yet. So we, we lived very different lives. He, we were going in very different directions. He, he was actually, he is actually one of my first big teen crushes but i this is not confessions of what i know about will wheaton one of these days i'll tell the most embarrassing story uh um well i might as well tell it now uh, i saw i came into his room and he was online and i had never seen anyone do this in real life and i'm like what are you doing he's oh i'm on this network 
that allows me to talk to <laughs> Star Trek fans. And they ask me questions and we talk about the show and stuff like that. And my immediate response was, that is the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> That's why Will Wheaton is a king of the internet. And I myself am not. Internet, so, that won't last. That, please. <laughs> Who wants to just talk about what they want to talk about? <laughs> on and on and on. Anyways, let's get to a podcast where we go on and on and on about what we want to talk about. Let's get into Friday the 13th. We begin in 1958, uh, when all great things happened in this country. Uh, what we want to get back to when America was great the first time, uh, unless you were a minority or a woman. And we meet uh, Barry and Claudette. They're never really named you only learn their names in the in the title in the title sequence or the end credits rather. And we see them, they're amongst other counselors, and they are singing Michael Road the Boat Ashore and giving each other fuck eyes. It's that's, about- a, that's an appropriate setting. That dude, that's very it's erotic, you know, summer camp and you're surrounded by young children. It's very erotically charged. I can, uh, yes. I, can I can definitely see this. Michael Road the Boat Ashore. I have to hum it to myself in order to gain an erection. That's how <laughs> just the kernel of it is so sexy. <laughs> the other thing that makes it just burst in fire of raw sexuality is you have two people in the most unnatural fibers, the whitest of white belts, shorts that are unflattering on him, on her, on human beings. I don't know what would look good in those shorts, but a satyr, perhaps. I don't know. But they're just bad outfits. And they look at each other like, if if we don't at least touch each other's genitals i'm gonna burst into flames and so she says let's go right now not out loud because what would the others think passes off a guitar and they're off and running into a barn or a boathouse we're, we're never really told but as soon as they're there they're just knocking knobby knees but keeping it completely covered up i don't know about you gina and you don't have to say but i am i was a bit of a you know a dry humping expert in my day (laughs) and i can tell you that those materials might have caused sparks if you rubbed them that much yeah that's that's definitely that's not the kind of heat you want to generate in a situation like that no but they're really driving it into one another On top of a blanket, on top of wood planks. I mean, yeah. You know, you got to do what you got to do. But it doesn't exactly scream super sexy to me. Yeah, I mean, these uniforms are very Bible camp, for lack of a better (laughs) phrase. Just, you know, I I think, you know, with the idea of, you know, to make everybody seem sort of asexual, I guess. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with Barry and Claudette, it did not work. I mean, they might as well have been wearing leather chaps and, and, and chains. But yes. But yeah, these are these are not outfits that were intended to make anybody seem particularly attractive to each other. No. And they work like gangbusters. Uh, neither of them, <laughs> at least from the neck down, uh, seems particularly super attractive. They go up to the second floor of whatever this is. It might be a boathouse, I think. It is an empty box storage facility. We will soon find yes. out. It's Full of the weirdest amalgamation of sundries. Now, I know my garage, I do have some empty cardboard boxes. Not enough to tell a killer, please don't kill me, (laughs) and try to block their blows with these empty boxes. But... Let's we're not there yet because Barry gets it first. The camera comes up the stairs. We get the killer POV that they've stolen from John Carpenter that John Carpenter stole from another USC student. And Barry tries to play this off when they're caught as Claudette starts buttoning her horrible yellow blouse and the shame comes over her as all women who've become sexual in 1958 would feel. Or, or and, ever, or ever, really, in the in yeah. these in these in these kinds of movies. So well, no one, no one wants to be caught dry humping, especially in mustard yellow t- uh, polo no. shirts. That's just mashing yeah. together. No, <laughs> oh. it's hard. And Barry says, "Hey, we weren't doing nothing." And let me tell you, kids, if you're of age and someone says, "What's going on here?" 
don't say we weren't doing nothing because that tells me you were doing something. Yeah. And just as soon as the words leave his lips, he's knifed in the stomach and he crumples to the ground. And he's spitting out what looks like you uh, call back to a Mystery Science Theater 3000 episode. It looks like he's spitting out a mouthful of Twizzlers. Yes. He's clutching his guts uh, where he's been stabbed and he just crumples to the ground and then we get Claudette's amazing fight for life where she (laughs) throws empty cardboard boxes not necessarily at her opponent but to the side of her opponent as to not hit the camera that the cameraman is holding in the the general direction of uh, I won't even say it's the general direction if I'm looking straight on at you she is throwing I'd say a good 20 to 30 degrees off of that maybe it's her swing maybe she needs to practice more but if you've seen the person you were with and the only one who could maybe help you in this particular circumstance immediately just get dropped with a knife start swinging start doing something i don't want to blame the victim here <laughs> but, I think, but I think i think a pattern in these movies is gonna be blaming the victim no i mean <laughs> I, mean, I mean let's let let's face it i mean there is a lot of particularly in the early movies, a lot of, well, I've had a good run, flat, axe to the face. <laughs> you know, it's just, just kind There's of sta- some giving up. Just kind of standing there and accepting their fate. She doesn't try very hard. No, she doesn't. I don't know if it's just the inherent sexism of these movies at the time, if it's anachronistic, but no, she's not given a lot of chance here. She just gives a minimum amount of effort and... She doesn't even get any dialogue. <laughs> no, she doesn't get any dialogue. She, 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 she mouths scre- it. She just screams and that's about She it. just screams and then she gets the <laughs> freeze frame treatment and disappears for time and all eternity. That freeze frame kind of becomes a motif throughout, um, but this is the first full gone to white and then we we get the Friday the 13th opening titles. Poor Barry and Claudette. They they loved hard and they, <laughs> they might not have loved well. They loved hard but died easily. <laughs> <laughs> they really did. They were not what you would call tough. You think how much kills. confidence, think how much confidence that must have given Pamela Voorhees that a woman in her oh no, she actually would have been in her what the 40s at this point 30, this 20, 30s 20 yeah, yeah i mean that easily took out two people one of them a guy half her age armed with you know probably like a kitchen knife and it just kitchen it knife was, for a hunting knife yeah yeah it this, was just that easy i mean you know the guy just stood there while she came up to him and stabbed him the girl tossed a couple obviously empty cartons at her and then just get you know, well you know that's all right i guess i deserve this it's not not a vainglorious death so This brings us to the moment in time in our podcast. It's called Would You Rather? And the options are very simple. We're going to look at each of these deaths and determine between you and I which one we would rather die as a result of. The options here are somewhat limited. Barry is stabbed in the stomach and we assume just bleeds out. And that can take a while and it's painful. And then you have Claudette and we don't know how she's killed. Now there's Some behind the scenes footage that shows her maybe having her throat slashed. Maybe that was a makeup test, but they never, ever filmed it. So how would you like to go out Gina Radcliffe stabbed in the stomach or disappear into a freeze frame and white out? You know, mouthful of Party City fake blood aside, I I, Mm -hmm. I got to say that Barry probably has the more dignified death here. I mean, again, he... (laughs) He just kind of he just kind of grabs his stomach eh, and falls over. You know, True. that's it. You know, maybe he immediately lost consciousness. So, yeah, I'm going to have to I don't want to go out tossing empty boxes at someone and flailing around. I'm going to I'm going to just crumple and fall. Well, I think Barry tried to deflect some things. And while Claudette did not really defend herself very well, because she fades off in, into this whiteout, I can only assume that maybe she transports herself into a different reality, maybe one that treats her better. So I'm going to go with Claudette. I'm going to go with just fading off into whiteout and we don't really know. And maybe maybe I would find out at that moment. I'm going to be contradictory (laughs) just to be contradictory. That's our relationship going forward, people. (laughs) Any last words for Barry and Claudette? 
no, they die quickly and in a relatively uninteresting way. So no, no, I have nothing to contribute in that regard. It doesn't really quite start with the bang of, let's say, a scream or a Halloween or, or, a, or, a, Elm Street. or a Friday the 13th part four where the dude gets his fucking head ripped off, which <laughs> I can't wait to get to that because <laughs> holy shit, I'm already rubbing my hands in anticipation, together in anticipation for that one. Oh, well, don't rub too hard because as we've seen today, that kind of friction can make people very uncomfortable <laughs> or incredibly sexually gratified. So I'm not going to tell you not to do it because that's really not my place. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that does it for us. I'm so glad that you can join us. Please come back again. We have so much Friday the 13th to talk about and not just this movie. We're going to go through the entire series. We're going to run the entire series from one all the way up to, I don't know what they're at anymore. I, I guess the, 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 are we doing the remake too? Must oh, be. yes. All oh, right, fine. We're doing the remake. Okay. Oh, yes. All right. Because unlike this movie, the best kill happens the first two people. And then it's a very <laughs> steep decline into Shitsville. Okay. So anyone wanted a preview? We'll be there, I don't know, a year and a half from now. I don't know how this is going to go. But every other week, we are going to be here. Please hit subscribe. Please, if you enjoyed the show, come back and join us. If you wouldn't mind, we're going to ask if if you like the show, please rate us on, on iTunes. Because that way we can be shared with more people. Otherwise, we'll, we'll slowly fade into obscurity. And you wouldn't want that to happen now, would you? Of course not. All righty, folks. That does it for today. Don't worry. The body count continues. That's right. We will be back with our very next episode to talk about our next kills. Uh, there's so much good stuff ahead of us, people. I can't wait for you to join us. So until next time, for myself and for my good pal, Gina Radcliffe, bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Kill by Kills produced by We Write Good and is intended for entertainment purposes only. Friday the 13th is owned by Paramount Pictures. Jason is owned by New Line Cinema. No infringement is intended. Kill by Kill logo was designed by Josh Hollis. Visit him at joshhollis.com. The Kill by Kill theme was created exclusively for us by Revenge Body. Get the whole track and much, much more at revengebodymemphis.bandcamp.com today.